when I had this sense of fairness, you know, and, and being a reporter, you just have a sense of fairness. Pol- there's absolutely nothing about politics that's fair. Absolutely nothing. There is no referee. There's nothing. No, nothing's fair. Welcome to Breaking Stereotypes with Todd and Tootsie. Today we are joined by Rachel Barnhart, Monroe County legislator and author of the book Broadcasted, Gender, Media, Politics, and Taking on the Establishment. And today Rachel will talk with us about all of those things. But before we get started, I'd just like to remind our viewers to hit like and subscribe to our channel as it will help the YouTube algorithm. Welcome, Rachel. Hello, thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. It's great to have you. It's great to have you, yes. So we'll start with our theme, which is breaking the stereotype. What do you think the stereotypes are of politicians? Oh, well, uh, there are a lot. When you say the word politician, I think people think of someone who is power hungry, self-interested, maybe um, pay to play, that kind of thing. Not necessarily public service. I like the term elected official or public Uh servant a little bit better, but politician is what it is. Politics is the activities that are associated with government. And politics, by the way, permeates absolutely everything. Of course. So you covered local politics as a broadcaster. Uh, What did you see that made you want to get into it yourself? Sure. So after 20 years of covering uh, politics and covering all levels of government, I got very frustrated that I kept interviewing the same people and covering the same problems and absolutely nothing was changing. And this was politicians on both sides of the aisle. Um, It was very frustrating to me that you couldn't get a straight answer to a question that... um, that you knew that they weren't being completely truthful, that they were making decisions that I thought were kind of slimy, and particularly Albany, uh, when we're talking, you know, particularly Albany, but really everything. I mean, our community has so many problems. And so I decided, well, I'm going to run for office and see what happens here. I really want to serve my community. And by the way, I think journalism is public service. It's the fourth estate. It's definitely a check on government. Our democracy really, really depends on a robust media um, holding government accountable. So I believe I, I did public service for a long time. Time, but I wanted to do it in a different way to see if I could solve problems. So I, so I left and I ran for office. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and ran and <laughs> ran and ran. And obviously you detailed some of that in your book. Um, and I know that as a broadcaster, you were you know exposed to a lot in politics. And yet you've said that you had no idea what you were in for as a candidate who ran for office and some of the sort of dirty Uh, Yeah, I didn't. um, So this was back in 2016. I ran for state assembly. I really was not prepared for a lot of different things. You know, I was a 40 year old woman who for the first time felt what it was to be a woman in the public eye, because all of a sudden, people um, really didn't take me seriously. They would make comment, I would be um, knock on social media or knocking on someone's door there was a lot like how old are you you're too pretty you're you know you should wear pants or you know dress down a little bit more and so much attention was focused on things that I just didn't realize I also realized that people really didn't have a lot of respect for TV reporters I people reduced my 20 year career in which I did a lot of investigative reporting to me reading the news just a news reader Mm-hmm. And uh, I just I didn't I thought I did really meaningful, serious work. And um, I, I learned that um, in politics, you know, people people really will say or say anything to win and to shape the narrative about you. I learned that you really <clears throat> need a lot of money to be heard by voters. You could be a great candidate and. And I'm not saying I was a perfect candidate, but you can be a great candidate. And if voters aren't hearing your message, then uh, then you're you're de- you're definitely at a disadvantage. Because you, and when I say be heard, you know, money uh, pays for mail, it pays for radio, it pays for TV, it pays for um, uh, sometimes staff to 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 make calls or to knock on doors, and so. All of these things really hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh, and then, you know, people I knew for 20 years just wouldn't talk to me anymore. You know, that was just, I was a horrible person for running against someone that they liked and their friend. And 
or, you know, the criticism I received just for running for office against maybe someone that they supported. Okay, just vote for that person. Um, But the vitriol that I experienced for making a choice to run and a, a lot of it, a lot of that choice was framed as being a horrible person for seeking power. Mm-hmm. And to me, I was just wanted to serve my community, <laughs> right. but instead it was framed as seeking power. And, you know, that was the year that Hillary Clinton lost um, against Donald Trump. And certainly, you know, she was, um, a lot of people were like, how dare you run? It doesn't, and then I, I started to realize, well, anytime a woman steps up to lead, it's often, um, it's often characterized as being vain or selfish or um, audacious when we don't ascribe those characteristics to men when they do it. Right. Now, Twenty. That was 2016. That was before lots of women in this country stood up and said, I'm running. And 2018, of course, was the year of the woman. A lot of women were elected to the House. It was wonderful. Um, and a lot changed after Hillary Clinton lost that election. We started to pay a lot more attention to the barriers that women face when they're running. And I'm not saying I lost because I'm a woman. I want to make that very, very clear. Politics is super complicated. And there are so elections are very, very complicated. And there's never one reason. If you see a headline, this person lost because or a take on Twitter. No, no. Politics are just very, very complicated. It's not one thing. And I don't want to make it very clear. I am not saying I lost elections because I was a woman. Right. At the same time, it was some of the personal attacks and, you know, some of the mudslinging and things like that that felt like maybe... It was because you're a woman. I mean, again, like oh, I don't think a man. I mean, there was yeah. a there was a website made that I was a prom queen running for office. Uh, there there was a lot that was activated because activated because I was a woman who was on television. It was pretty, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. um, and and uh, and it was really it was really frustrating. And I just wasn't prepared for that. I just I wasn't prepared. I. I'm so much better at dealing with that. I'm also older now, but I'm so much better at dealing with a lot of that stuff now than I was then. I, I no one teaches, no one teaches you that. I'm no one teaches you that. And you'd think that being in the public eye for so long as I was, that I would have been more resilient, but just personally, I just wasn't. I, I, when I had this sense of fairness, you know, and, and being a reporter, you just have a sense of fairness there's absolutely nothing about politics that's fair. Absolutely nothing. There is no referee. There's nothing. No, nothing's fair. Mm -hmm. And so was that, you know, kind of during the primary stages where it's actually Democrats, like for example, I've only run in primaries. Okay. Yeah. And so, so yeah, so it was was our own, it was the democratic party that was setting up those websites, not even Republicans. Progressives. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And that must've been why Mm -hmm. it hurt as as much as it did. It was, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I still see some of this stuff today, but a lot less of it. Well, you, now you've got AOC, you've got so many, you, you, it's just so different now than from what I experienced. But mm-hmm. again, um, politics is is uh, elections and politics is just, it can be very nasty and there's probably nothing as nasty as a Democratic primary. It's mm-hmm. like, it's like a family fight. Mm-hmm. So why did you stay in it? given, you know, and keep running when you had been through all of this? What made you want to stick well, it out? I, I just felt like I was going to be persistent. Not sure I made the best decisions in the races I chose to run after that, but uh, I I really believed in what I was doing. I had support. I had campaign volunteers. I had the apparatus. I got better at it. I learned. And, um, you know, finally, I wasn't, I was done uh, after I lost in 2018 for Congress, I was done. I, you know, I wasn't planning to run again. I was thinking of starting a nonprofit news website. I really wasn't trying to get back into it, but mm, I was approached to run for county legislator. It's a part-time position and a small district, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And it was a really hard race because um, they threw everything at me. That by this time, I was so hated by everyone. <laughs> they threw everything at me. Like, I, I joke, I still have the mailer where, like, every elected official was on this mailer, essentially telling people to vote for my opponent. And I still have it. Um, I won. You know, mm-hmm. I won that race. I won handily. I improved my performance by 11% in this most recent um, election, my re-election. And I think I've done a really, really good job. And I think I've proven critics wrong um, in terms, you know, 
uh, I might be a real um, fighter uh, on the campaign trail, but I work with everyone. And I, if I held a grudge, I wouldn't get anything done because I really wouldn't have any friends at all. If I was mad at every single person who did something awful in politics, I would have zero friends. Mm-hmm. None. <laughs> wow. So can you tell us a little bit about exactly what a county legislator does? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> yeah, so we have um, Monroe County. Um, it has a $1.3 billion budget. Monroe County is really, it's a human services provider. So uh, when people seek public assistance, whether it's emergency housing, emergency food, m- uh, Medicaid, the county, uh, most of its budget, or more than half its budget is human services. We have a health department. What did we experience over the last two years? COVID. So the health department... Um, it plays a really big role in, in our community. We have an airport, we have parks, we have sewers, we have roads, the, we have the we have a couple authorities, the bus, the bus, uh, the the water authority. We um, have a I'm on the planning board too, in which we approve. I just got on the planning board where we approve capital projects. We have Frontier Field that we own, and so. There is so much that uh, Monroe Monroe County does. So uh, we also have the courts, the DA, the sheriff. And so what does a legislator do, whether it's Monroe County or anywhere else? The essential job of a legislative body is oversight. Um, It's it's the policymaking body and oversight. So we, um, we approve the budget. We approve changes to the budget. We can also make policy. For example, I had two um, pieces of legislation passed. I want to say three, but one went went through the administration. I wasn't the sponsor of it. But for example, one was we passed a law so that you have to give bicycles three feet to when you pass them, a minimum of three feet. Another one, uh, we passed a law that Grubhub can't list your restaurant without your approval. Um, That was rampant. Um, And there were all kinds of mistakes on menus and they were, and it was just really horrible. And then the other one, I worked with a sheriff to make sure that inmates had access to free phone calls. I really am opposed to profiting from incarceration. I wanted all the calls to be free. Didn't get my way on that, but we came to a compromise that I think is really good. They get 75 minutes a week free. Um, And so that was legislation that was passed. Um, And so this is um, a legislature that is um, the Republicans have a majority. They have a one vote majority right now, their caucus. And so you can't change. I'm not going to change the world. Um, on the Monroe County Legislature. So I'm trying to pick the things that we can work together on and be effective on. That said, the platform, so for some reason, I mean, listen, I was always loud and I always feel like, you know, I had some influence. I think that people did listen to me, but now that I'm a, now that I have an elected official, all of a sudden I want to race and now people, now I matter more, I guess, or now I, my voice matters, which is very annoying. Okay. I don't think that losing a race makes you lesser or winning makes you better, but I have a platform. And so I try to use it to advocate for the things that are really important to me. And I was named one of the most influential Western New York politi- pol- people in politics as a result, even though I'm a part-time county legislator, that's because I use my platform to really advocate for things. Um, that I care about, but it's more than that. I think one of the reasons why I land on these kinds of lists is because I'm very independent. I have a fire wallet between myself and my job and my job's not located here. So I can be more free to hold local officials accountable for both sides of the aisle for things that I see that aren't right. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like on social media, whether that be Facebook, I know you said Twitter was kind of your platform of choice. I like Twitter, yeah. Um, You know, this has been something that even when you weren't elected, you had that platform and you spoke out. And so it's something that was was continual for you, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't all of a sudden I get elected, now I'm going to speak. No. It was something that... I mean, I'm a storyteller. Yeah. That's what I do. I've been mm-hmm. a storyteller for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so I use social media to tell stories. And sometimes it's sharing stories mm-hmm. and sharing my thoughts about what you know what what's going on. My free speech is so important to me. I, I'm, it's just so important to me. I really don't want anyone to tell me what to say. Um, I try to pick my battles. I've learned a great deal. I've grown so much in politics. I'm actually really glad that I left news because I feel like I've grown so much professionally and personally and just learned a lot more, um, outside of the media bubble. Uh, but yeah, but I still really like being able to wake up every day, read the news and say, I, this is what I think about this article. This is what I think about this topic. And it does move people because, when you when you start having a when you have random people following you on Twitter just because maybe they know you from the news or they know you're a county legislator, and all of a sudden they're like you're challenging maybe what they think, 
and then they engage with you and then maybe I've moved them or and by the way sometimes people move me it's a great place to listen to what the public is thinking like what are they thinking what are their responses to things like right now I know that uh, people a lot of people want to reform bail reform <laughs> they want to p- roll it back and I understand why because there's been incredible propaganda out there about bail reform um None of it's really true, but it does. Move, but but the, my side that uh, supports bail reform has just lost. Has really lost that narrative. We've lost the narrative. Um, people believe that bail reform needs to be changed because or rolled back because of crime increase. There's just no evidence of that. But you can't convince anyone of that because the news media hasn't hasn't really done a great job in in telling telling that story. My side hasn't. However. I know that's going on because I'm listening to people all day long and they're not crazy. These are regular people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, How do you, how do you feel about being in the media and then now being elected official and then seeing how the media presents things? And I, I'm sure that things have changed over time. Like you said, this is probably the most divisive time in our lifetime. Um, but you know, if you watch Fox news, you're going to get one narrative. You watch CNN, you're going to get another, um, or you listen to wham, and Lonsbury or whatever, so different than yeah. any other perspective. When I watch Fox News, I, I feel like I'm in a, watching a completely different narrative of the world as I understand it. Mm-hmm. I think, um, but I also think though that the mainstream media doesn't do a great job either. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna call them out on COVID. I think they scared the crap out of everyone on COVID and really didn't put risk into context. Um, there was there have been study after study showing that American media was so much more negative about COVID than the rest of the world. We made parents think that their children were at great risk when children are at the lowest risk. We, And that was the media that did that. And so when New York State was having this, um, and one thing that really bothered me is when New York State in particular was having this debate over masking children still, you know, very few people know that the, the United Kingdom never masked children under 12 ever um, that very few people know that the World Health Organization says don't mask kids under six to follow they're following the precautionary principle did you guys know that no you wouldn't know that because our mainstream media doesn't tell you it seems like kind of important information when we're talking about these cost benefit decisions mm-hmm. when we're talking about you know is this the right thing to do or not these are very emotionally fraught conversations about safety and risk and children that we love and and shutting down schools, right? You know, during yes. that, all that oh, time. Oh, don't even get me started on school closings. <laughs> but but it was like the media, sure. all of a sudden, in the summer of 2021, it became okay to talk about the, the cost of school closings. But if you talked about it in the spring of 2021, you were like called a murderer. And meanwhile, Europe opened schools far earlier than the United States did pre-vaccine. And so I could go on and on about how I think the mainstream media did such a disservice to the public by chasing fear, um, because fear and clicks sells. And I... I um, I could talk about this all day. I really <laughs> believe that the progressive position on COVID was always harm reduction. Um, th- th- I didn't I didn't recognize my fellow progressives on COVID. Uh, harm reduction means that you um, you weigh the costs and the benefits, and you recognize that humans are human beings and are going to be humans. So to ask to to take an abstinence approach on sex, we don't do that. We've long decided we can't do that because that just gets teen girls pregnant. We don't do that. Uh, we get instead give kids the tools to have sex if you want to have sex and have safe sex. But with COVID, we told people isolate at home. Well, what did they do? They had parties in their basement uh, that oh. were unventilated. And, uh, you know, uh, you can't tell pe- that this abstinence only approach. And we also treated everyone like they had the same risk. We did not, not everyone did have the same risk. We knew that elderly were far more at risk. So, but, and then, and then, um, with vaccines, same thing. I mean, we we uh, when they told everyone who was vaccinated put their masks back on, I thought, oh gosh, we're we're totally t- going to tell people right now that vaccines don't work. I mean, I know that's not what we were saying, but we were kind of saying that, um, and that was the message that the anti vaxxers seized upon, and then vaccinated people got scared, and then it all went to hell. And a lot of people could see this coming because. Um, we just we just don't treat any other public health thing the way we treated COVID. We don't treat HIV that way. We don't treat uh, teen pregnancy that way. We just don't treat things. And, and for some reason, all these progressives just lost the plot. And they thought they were helping the vulnerable by taking these real hardline authoritarian positions on COVID. But they weren't. Because you know how I know they weren't? Because my, my census tract is 50% vaccinated. So making this some kind of like MAGA, GOP... Um, issue where 
own, where they were responsible for COVID outcomes. I'm sorry, but Democrats own the fact that the city of Rochester is only 60% vaccinated, and my census tract is 50% vaccinated. It's a Democrat. Those are Democrats, and we really lost sight while we were arguing over masking ch- low risk children. N- people were dying in the city, right and left, because we were not focused on helping them. So. Um, that's a long way for me to answer your question about the mainstream media. I think it's, <laughs> it's okay. all. I think it, I think it all um, played into. I think that polarization. It's that mm-hmm. polarization really played into fed fed killed. It killed people. It actually killed people because the right was obsessed with downplaying COVID and vaccines, and the left was obsessed with um, taking this super hard line that really didn't meet people where they were on the virus, mm-hmm. and 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 they were so obsessed with like blaming the right. Meanwhile, you had all these people who needed actual help and information and we didn't give it to them and they died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because (laughs) that was a (laughs) really, I was a touch of rant. You're fired up and I appreciate it. That's okay. That's what we're doing here. But that's, you know, that's why you're on this show because I think the, you know, what we think is the way that you break stereotypes most is that you diverge from party lines when you feel strongly about an issue, right? And so COVID probably being the most obvious Oh, it was very one. hard to be a progressive in COVID who felt the way I did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very, very hard. It's less hard now because I do think I've moved a few people who were really <laughs> mad at me, but uh, it was really hard. I mean, I've never felt in my life as someone who's on the, on the social media for a long time, who's generally not scared of speaking out. I've never felt in my life as scared to say, I don't think toddlers should be masked. That just doesn't sound right to me. That seems silly. Like, I've never felt more scared in my life to say those words out loud. And that it, what I just said, that's actually the conventional wisdom in most of the world. But I felt scared mm-hmm. to say it in the United States because I thought that my tribe, my, my progressives, I thought there would be political consequences for me. And maybe one day there will be. I don't know. Well, were there consequences within your own party? Like, did you get blowback from your peers who were in office? Not elected and- officials, but certainly a lot of the progressive supporters, some of them in my district, mm-hmm. you know, definitely hit back on me on social media. But not mostly in healthy ways. Like, most of, mostly, you know, we had healthy discussions. But there were some people who, you know, there were some local pediatricians. Some of them were really prominent who were really mad at me like just really really mad at me and i i just really disagreed with them i disagreed with this like rigidity this certainty uh i think medical i think we would have had a lot more trust in public health and doctors if they would have just admitted uncertainty mm-hmm. you know this is yeah, hey this sure. is my recommendation however there are other recommendations out there and this is but this is what i believe in why but you know there's some uncertainty no one ever talks that way it was like you are a horrible human being and you're spreading misinformation if you don't think toddlers should be masked like that's not misinformation that's like who says don't do it the world health organization says don't do it so how could it be misinformation and we started labeling misinformation everything that we just didn't agree with that's not science. That's not healthy. That's not that's horrible discourse. But I've never felt in my life the way I did during COVID by questioning school closures, questioning masking toddlers, questioning putting masks back on vaccinated people. I just um, all I want is to have healthy, spirited, constructive discourse. And it's like you just couldn't have it, mm-hmm. it without people yelling at you that you're some kind of murderer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think COVID actually lengthened the divide? Because it seems like from my perspective anyway, is that the the left, or at least a small percentage of it, has gone way left. And then yeah. the right has gone way right. Um, and so, and you know, where I consider myself, honestly, kind of in the middle, mm-hmm. um, although I lean left. But it's something that, with some of the, the things that are coming out of the left now, I just can't have a hard time getting on board with. Well, and, yeah, you, we radicalized people during COVID. I mean, I know people whose businesses were shut down during the lockdown, during the stupid orange zones, restaurant across the street's open. Mm-hmm. This person's restaurant has to be closed. Um, I know uh, one family that suffered a tragedy, tra- tragic consequences from the lockdown. I don't want to go into it right now, but pe- that, that family's radicalized now. You know, they, 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 really, they, they really believe conspiracy is like very radicalized because of what government did to them. Uh, because of the go- decisions that government made, um, and then you have, and then you have Trump, who uh, was so um, so out there and broke so many norms when he was president. That yeah, people on the left definitely punch back really hard, and maybe they got radicalized a little bit too. Um, that said, um, the 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 divisions are are 
they're very, very real and they're very stark. And co- the COVID discourse in this country just everything became about dogma and it, not science. And um, it really hurt both sides. And I have progressive friends um, and, and, you know, followers on Twitter who really hate it when I they're like, you're both sizing this. The Republicans killed thousands and thousands of people. I mean, that's true. Um, arguably way worse. The vaccines really do work. They are the way out. Um, you get a va- you're, you know you might get COVID with the vaccine, but you're probably gonna stay out of the hospital. And uh, yeah, so the Republicans definitely the anti-vax stuff that permeated the downplaying COVID, the not wanting to get a vaccine because um, you just hate to own the libs. That happened, and people died. But that doesn't mean that the liberals don't have any response. Don't have any. Um, role to play. I guarantee you there are people who didn't get vaccinated because they were so pissed off about stupid mask rules or pissed off about lockdowns. Um, they all work together. That mm-hmm. all works together. And I think Democrats went way too far on COVID. They just didn't meet people where they were and it was bad public health. Mm-hmm. Are there any other areas where you feel like Democrats are kind of moving to? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, so, well, yes and no. Right. Okay. So, I am to the left, right? So mm-hmm. I just said, I don't want you to reform uh, bail reform. I believe in universal health care. I believe in universal child care. I believe in the overdose prevention centers, and I'll be doing a speech tomorrow about that. Uh, I, I'm pretty like AOC. I'm a lefty, okay? Mm-hmm. That said, and, and this is something that AOC talks about too, and she, she's a really good communicator, I think. Um, the Democratic Party as a whole, I mean, Biden's poll numbers are in the tank right now. Because they're not solving problems. We, if I were to look at the Democratic Party, even in Monroe County, uh, this is the part. This is my party. All right, I am a Democrat. Definitely not a Republican. And the way the Republicans are going right now, a little scary. You know, got definitely got a little authoritarian, fascist streak there. Uh, what they're doing right now to LGBT uh, youth, what they're doing with the the Florida bill, uh, librarians I heard today, local librarians I heard today are getting um, harassed on social media because if they have books about being gay. You know, this is terrible. Uh, so the culture wars, I, no. But the Democrats, you know, what are we just the party of good government? Don't get arrested. Are we the party? Uh, like, what are, what are we the party of treading water and just lightly fixing things here and there? I don't know that that's good enough anymore. Um, I think people really, really want their problems solved. And I think during the pandemic, there was sort of a reordering, certainly of labor. Certainly, the stimulus checks allowed people to save. We have um, uh, and those savings are now dwindling. We uh, we have we have a need for a better safety net. They couldn't extend the earned income tax credit, and um, which helped lift millions of children out of poverty. And they couldn't get a deal done to save it. And sure, the sure we can say the Republicans are to blame, but honestly, the the Democrats aren't. What are you? What are we fighting for? You know, what are we fighting for? What are we trying to get done? What are we fighting for? Sometimes you can just fight for something and build a movement and take the L and say, we fought for this so much. Um, and they're the ones to blame. But right now, I don't see, where's the fight? What are we fighting for? Isn't one of the one of the criticisms of government that it's hard to get anything done and mm-hmm. they don't get anything done or when they do, it's, it's this broad across the board, you know, like lock everyone down or cut everyone the same exact stimulus check, no matter where you live or if you're working or not. And, you know, that's my impression of COVID was everything was done in this giant chunk Mm-hmm. That didn't really, you know, the people that needed help didn't get it. And the people that needed, that were wanted to go out couldn't. And it was sort of like everybody lost, right? Sure. I mean, government is incentivized. A lot of our politicians are incentivized not to solve problems. They have lobbyists who are writing them campaign checks. They have... Um, districts that are heavily gerrymandered so that they have to play to the most extreme partisans in their districts and or they're just not accountable to anyone because they know that they're going to go home and never face a democratic opponent because their district is so gerrymandered or vice versa never face a republican opponent in fact petitions are being filed this week in monroe county i don't think there's any primaries i don't think there's a lot of primaries going on i think um I don't, and, and there may not even, and, and there there won't be a lot of serious contests in November because of gerrymandering, um, and you know, 
and, and that's not a criticism of our current reps. And I'm not in any way suggesting that they're bad and not accountable to the people and doing a bad job. But I'm just saying that that is a system that uh, if you did have a bad actor, might be kind of hard to get rid of them. And um, and and it and uh, so anyway. The, the system isn't really designed to solve problems right now, which is why we need campaign finance reform. We really need to ban partisan gerrymandering. We also should do ranked choice voting. I'm a big proponent of that. And frankly, this is really going to get me in trouble. This is another one. <laughs> this is another one where Democrats would disagree with me, but I do think we need open primaries. I think um, open primaries would mean that everyone who's registered to vote can go, um, I mean, really wouldn't even call it an open primary, uh, runoff, like runoff elections where everyone can vote might be better. Pick your top four. That's how they're going to do the Alaska uh, Alaska elections now. Top four, top five get to move on. And uh, everyone can vote. And that's just more reflective, I think, of what the population really wants. And Lisa Murkowski is going to be supporting the new Supreme Court Justice um, nominee. Well, people, a lot of people, I mean, I think she would have done it anyway. But a lot of people are saying it's because of ranked choice voting. It's because Democrats are going to be able to go vote for her in Alaska. And, you know, she's facing this Trump um, supported opponent. So people are saying, well, because she is facing this, this uh, because she's going to be elected by ranked choice voting, she's going to be fine because a lot of people from other parties are going to be able to support her and she'll be able to make it on the ballot in November. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do to make our democracy more representative and more responsive to fix problems. But right now, I think that Democrats are just scared of their own shadows. They're scared of the ads that will come out about them. They're scared of all that. I get it. I don't. I wouldn't want bad ads to come out about me. In fact, there was a bad one. My last one. My last re-election campaign, an anonymous person. I have my ideas. Sent two thousand letters to voters in my district with me in front of a sign saying "F the police." Well, you know, I didn't know the sign was there. I mean, I knew it was there, but I was speaking at an event. Mm-hmm about a police station in my neighborhood that I didn't think should be built. Or if you're gonna build it, make sure there's other things in there for the community because an office for a police station is not sold properly in neighborhoods. It's sold like, well, we're gonna have a police station in the neighborhood. That doesn't mean police are gonna be out walking the streets, they're gonna get their cars, go answer 911 calls. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that they're in the neighborhood. They're there to drop off their cars in the morning and do roll call and leave. Um, so I felt there should be other things at the center for the neighbors. And so I'm at this event that I was invited to by neighbors to speak at this event about it. And there's this sign behind me and it will follow me for the rest of my life. It was my Hanoi Jane moment. It will follow me for the rest of my life. This sign, which I don't support the message. And um, what a city newspaper reporter, I just happened to be standing in front of it speaking. And anyway, that picture was sent to 2000 people. My phone mm-hmm. rang. But because voters know me, they know I would never say something. Like, they actually thought it was photoshopped. It was not photo. Yeah, it was a real photo. You could easily do that nowadays. Yeah, and it was a real you photo. You were standing in front of it versus holding it or wow. creating it, obviously. And I was surrounded by my neighbors, mm-hmm. surrounded by children even. And mm-hmm. just it's silly to think that um, that I would ever you know, say something like that or support that kind of message, even though I am critical of police uh, often. Um you know, I, I recognize that I just think we I think we I think we have to look at public safety as all the things, not just police. By the time police mm-hmm. are there, too late. <laughs> public mm-hmm. safety is housing. Public safety is mental health. Public safety is jobs. It's education. It's all the things. It's not just police. Um, police do not prevent crime uh, if they and, and they are not defunded. So, you know, uh, anyway. I forgot where I was going with this about the default. Oh, yeah. So that happened. The ads, right? So Democrats are scared of their own shadow. They're scared of the ads that might come to the their houses and things like that. But um, again, I think that voters might respect us more if we actually went out there and fought for things that would make their lives better and communicated that and told that story. I I think people are ready after this pandemic. I think they're ready for universal health care and paid leave and child care. I think they're ready. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> well, you know, it ends up it, it being this this thing where all those things sound great, but then it's also big government. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people, you know, including myself and I have a Tootsie, you feel this way to a certain degree, is that when we feel that there's a bigger government, a lot of times things don't get done, they get stuck. And it's one of those things where it's super frustrating. So it's kind of scary to say, let's hand over everything to the government mm-hmm. because sometimes the sure. government is, isn't that efficient. I'm the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> right. Well, listen, we have government programs that run great. Social sure. Security, although they need more staffing to help people. Uh, Medi- Medicare is a great program. I mean, we have 
government actually does do some things that are really yeah. good. Uh, Can I give you a little pushback on Social Security, for yes. example? Um, well, you know, working in the mental health field for as long as I did, for example, if somebody had a very debilitating mental health issue, a lot of times it would take them three to four times of applying to even get looked at. Oh, no. And so yes. it's this year year's process where then people are having to try to survive. Yes. You the know. SSI issue is uh, it's horrific. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the way that that's set up, the, the fact that people have to get lawyers, that they have to go to court, it's, mm -hmm. hor it's horrible. I was referring it more to more yeah, I understand. the social net for so seniors, yes. but you're completely correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's where some people may say, okay, if we, ha you know, if, obviously in Sweden it works great. But will it work here? Mm -hmm. You know, that's give people uh, money. <laughs> just give people money. I know that's IP. It, it's just so offensive when I say that people mm -hmm. get so upset. Just give everyone money. You want to solve poverty? Give them money. <laughs> it mm -hmm. works. It just works. I'm a big proponent of guaranteed basic income. Mm -hmm. How many studies do we need to show that if you give people five hundred dollars extra a month, like it actually improves their health and improves their lives and improves their children's lives? It just, uh, you know. We have to raise wages. We have uh, and, and really consider that. Um, but wages are really low. Uh, something like twenty five percent of New Yorkers earn minimum wage. In Mississippi, it's like forty five percent. Can you imagine that? That's oh. horrible. Yeah. Is, isn't it made it difficult though? For example, you know all, all the checks that were given out during the pandemic. Then there's this huge gap as far as workers. Mm -hmm. You know, restaurants are closing down. People can't find workers. And it's something that, well, I, you know, I, and I actually think UBI, UBI is a good idea. I'm just wondering, though, if, if it's if it's one of those things where it. it yeah, well, it, studies show studies of people okay. who get UBI show that they actually work. And sometimes we even work at higher rates. That's really not that's not really not the issue. I think if we want people to go back to work right now, we have to make working better. Mm -hmm. People don't want to work in crappy jobs. They don't want to work for nothing. They don't want to they don't want to get injured or expose their health. And childcare, I can't emphasize this enough. Childcare is huge. And let's remember as recently as January schools were still closing be, because of staffing issues. Parents uh, I mean, I follow moms on Twitter, middle class moms who were like, I've lost I've been set back in my career. I've lost so much income because of the pandemic and school closings because it falls on women mostly. So I think it's really, really complicated. I actually think universal childcare would be a huge economic development. Um, I think people would go back to work and school in droves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, the, the bottom line when it comes to, like I've had a lot of anecdotal experiences as far as having uh, business owners, for example. Like I, I knew a guy who owned a few, three fast food restaurants who was bringing in 500k a year probably spending 10 hours a week at work the rest of the time on the golf course or in mm. florida and paying his employees minimum wage and yeah. there and so that was something that was really disgusting to me yeah. that he couldn't up his uh income to his employees or just show up more and be part of the process and mm -hmm. The ironic thing is that he he inherited all these, so it was something that he didn't even he didn't start as the the fry guy and then work his way up to owning three you know I won't say the restaurant chain, mm -hmm. but it's something that, um, you know I, I I think definitely could be done. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, people, and especially in the restaurant industry, a lot of people left that industry. And you have to remember, too, in the pandemic, people made life decisions, really different life decisions. And a lot of people who were servers said, I don't like this. I can make more money being a FedEx driver. Uh, I can make more money working in an office. This this lifestyle that people thought they needed and had to do, all of a sudden, they're realizing, I have other options and other things that I can do instead. And I think universal health care, universal child care, paid leave would go a long way to shoring up our workforce and making workers and make, just making it easier to work um, and giving people the support they need to work. Um, but people people who have choices are exercising those choices right now and saying, I don't want to work at McDonald's for, for 15 bucks an hour even. And a lot of them are exercising those choices. Um, it's Workers have so much more power now. They're... Um, Forming labor unions. Look at what's happening in Starbucks. Look what just happened at Amazon and Staten Island. Oh, locally, we've got my my vet. My, well, not my vet, but unfortunately, I've had to take my dog to the emergency vet. Uh, they're union, union, unionizing. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really extraordinary to see. Uh, really, really extraordinary to see. And I'm glad that workers are doing it. They have more power now than ever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So I know you say you're liberal, and a lot of your views obviously are. Well, progressive but, is the word. <laughs> <laughs> liberal, she's progressive. I'm fine she's with either one. I'm fine with either one. But a lot of your views also sound at least libertarian, I would oh, say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so have you ever thought about... No. Okay. There's no way. <laughs> um, no, because, I mean... I was talking about legalizing marijuana before, you know, back in 2016. My opponent now supports it, but that did not then. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely think on drugs, yes. Um, on COVID. COVID, mm-hmm. eh, no. I mean, I believe in government support. I mean, I believe that government needed to do a better job vaccinating and giving support, financial support. So, mm-hmm. not really. Okay. But I do think um, there were there were libertarian parts of what I believed, you know, I don't think that we should have restricted people to the extent that we did because it wasn't going to work. Um, I think you have to look at humans and, and human behavior and uh, public health. It's it's crucial to to meet people where they are. Um, but but yeah, there are some libertarian, uh, some libertarian leanings in there. Yes. Mm-hmm. But I'm definitely not a pure libertarian. I, I mean, I'm in favor of gun control. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's very mm-hmm. clear states with gun control just have fewer homicides and suicides. And, and that's the thing. Thing that kills me on social media. All oh, these democratic cities. Da, 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 da. Okay, per capita, the red states do worse. Mm-hmm. They do worse when it comes to gun um, violence. Well, and all cities are pretty much democratic, anyways. Right? Most are, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's. I mean, it's it's more about poverty than it, than, than it is about. Um, you know, what your political party affiliation is. <laughs> right. Can we just solve poverty? Can we just focus on that? I mean, mm-hmm. Rochester's got the number two child poverty rate in the entire country. And why mm-hmm. don't we talk about this? It's just some shameful thing that we think is inevitable. It's not inevitable. Mm-hmm. We can do something about it. Rachel, can we switch uh, mm-hmm. directions a little bit and just talk a little bit about yourself? So <gasps> you um, you were born here. You were mm-hmm. raised here. Um, your parents were two city school mm-hmm. district teachers. You went to John Marshall High School, which is, mm-hmm. um, you know, in a poor neighborhood mm-hmm. um, and probably mostly minority. Oh, yes. Uh, mm-hmm. And um, and then you went to Cornell mm-hmm. and then came back um, and was an investigative reporter for, like you said, 20 years. Um, it sounds like, you know, you're a very bright person. You had a lot of options. Why why come back here? Why stay here? Um you know, um, why still live in a city and you live in a neighborhood that is uh, is poor as well? Um, it's something, I mean, you're living amongst your people. And that's very rare as a, as a politician, huh? I would say. Well, I mean, maybe. I, look, I went to Marshall High. That's where it really shaped who I am today. It was, um, I saw up close educational um, in- inequality, income inequality. I mean, I saw it all. Uh, and that was in the early 90s, which I never thought this city would get as violent as it was then. But we're there, unfortunately, again. But um, but some things were different then. I mean, the teen pregnancy rate was so high. It is has not been as high ever as it was back then. Um, the things that I saw and experienced there, um, yeah, I mean, it was pretty heavy stuff. Um, and... I just felt like I always, I loved writing. I was an intern at what was then our news in college. Um, and it, I just was like, this is what I want to do. I loved it. I loved the news. I loved everything about it. I loved chasing news stories. And um, I came back and worked for them. And um, I, I just didn't want to leave. I, for me, going to climb the ranks of the TV news ladder Back then, it might be a little different now, but back then, you know, okay, go from Rochester to Pittsburgh, then go from Pittsburgh to St. Paul, go from St. Paul to Chicago, go from Chicago to a network. I don't want to do my 20, why do I want to spend my 20s and early 30s doing that? I don't want to do that. Um, the, we're, report on stuff in cities that I don't care about for a dream that I don't have. I didn't want to do mm-hmm. that. I And to be honest with you, I really hated TV news. I, the only thing that I liked about TV news was telling the stories about things I cared about. That the the medium itself, the shallowness of it, the um, the hustle, the having to do a story every day, even if it was crap because you had to fill the show, mm-hmm. the quality, oh, horrible. There's so much about TV news that I hated. I really could not imagine myself doing it in another city. I couldn't, could never imagine myself doing that. So that's why I stayed. Okay. That makes sense. Well, and obviously, like I really liked. Yeah, obviously, I really liked. You care. Yeah, yeah, obviously, my parents are here, and I really mm-hmm. like. I like this community. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really liked it, and I, I didn't. And I was really idealistic. Them a little less so now, mm-hmm. um, but I, 
you know, I really like, I really liked the community. So I stayed. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you know, the ship just sailed and I was like, okay, I'm not leaving. Mm-hmm. So you're obviously very career driven, but what do you do for fun? Um, you used to swim at the Y, didn't you? I, yeah, they closed my downtown Y. I was really, really, really upset about that. I spoke out about that. Um, See, even your hobbies become political. <laughs> oh, let me tell you, the retiring CEO there, he does not like me. Okay. Uh, I've been speaking out about them for a long time. Uh, you know, abandoning uh, two city branches, two of their three city branches in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, I Just outrageous as they built the Taj Mahal Y out in Pittsburgh, the most affluent suburb. Just a real slap in the face to so many people. It was a disgusting decision. It was racist. I could. I just was very angry about it. Uh, and so, yeah, they they closed my Y. Um, and yes, I'm a swimmer. Mm-hmm. So uh, I now swim at LA Fitness, which kill, I mean, it's a nice facility. It just kills me. I also have a pass to the Webster Aquatic Center. Can't wait for the Genesee Valley Park. Park pool to reopen this year i think they redid it cannot wait to try it out again um so yeah i'm an avid swimmer i eat out a lot i have a lot of uh core set of friends and we love to go out to eat uh and you know i I, i'm now uh the early bird special old lady uh (laughs) no that's what my friends joke but honestly because of the pandemic like you can't go out it's like seven or eight o'clock anymore and expect to get a seat at a bar to eat or if you you really need reservations now because everything is changed um staffing has changed hours have changed and fewer locations it seems it just seems very everything's just different so i want to go out early mm-hmm. um but yeah so I, I hang out with my friends quite a bit and um and i you have a dog that i have you a love, little right? dog penny <laughs> And, uh, and, and if I haven't, if we haven't talked about it, I, I mean, I read a lot of news, so I'm, I'm re I read a lot and I just plowed through four seasons of Yellowstone. Okay. Which, wow. <laughs> it's like Godfather meets dynasty. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's With Kevin good... Costner. I hate Kevin Costner. <laughs> I really liked, I really liked Yellowstone. Uh-huh. Yeah. I've always had this kind of th- theory about the news, not th- that it's something that it's largely negative because of the fact that it makes people feel better about their own lives. I think that if, because think about all the different news stories that could be presented, right? There's a lot of positive things that go on in every, every day, you know, um, somebody donates Mm. to a charity, Mm -hmm. um, you know, a a new nonprofit is started, whatever, but it's this person lost their life on the highway today there's oh, yeah. this murder, this so on and so forth. And I stopped watching the news, the local news, a long time ago. Yeah. And it's something that um, I haven't missed at all. No, I, I stopped watching TV news back in like 2008 when mm-hmm. I worked for it. I don't mm-hmm. watch TV news. I thought it was just, I just didn't, don't enjoy it. It's mm-hmm. very, very shallow. I don't even watch cable news. I just don't. I, actually, I, you know, there's one, well, two. I love PBS NewsHour. Love it. A Judy Woodruff show. I love it. It's so smart and they have great conversations on there, really in depth. I absolutely love PBS News Hour. So that's one new show I love. I also really dig us. Uh, I used to really like CBS This Morning. Haven't watched it in a long time, but I like that one too. Again, another one, really smart. But those are the ones that are like last in the rating. So of course, those are the ones that I like. Um, but no, I, I agree with you. I didn't find much substance or value in it. Um, I always used to say I enjoyed doing my web story the written form of my story a lot better than i did the visual talking about it store piece because of the web i could add all these details and quotes that i could not fit into a minute and 30 seconds um so i didn't i don't miss i don't miss it you know i i love um I love like going on Evan Dawson show or uh, something like this where we can talk and have a real conversation and something in depth that is, I think, more meaningful and you get more out of it than um, than, you know, a tele- television news. That said, I do have to point this out that, you know, the Democrat and Chronicle just really isn't producing that much content right now. And and they have such a talented staff and this is not a knock on their staff i did love the story they did this week on tree equity the trees it was just a great story they do really good work but if but when i go to channel 10 or channel 13's website i just get so much i can really get so much more local content and just kind of get a glimpse of what's going on like that in a way that i can't on the dnc website anymore and i want to give a shout out to wxxi and city which are the nonprofit news space which is really filling a gap as well mm-hmm. But no, you're right, Todd. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, 
we talked about before, it's, you know, to the point where even at the, you know, the, the national and the cable news and so on and so forth, it's, you know, I remember watching in the first days of the pandemic, you know, it was just like the death toll. It was on the screen at the all time. And, you know, talk about scaring people. You know, if they did that for the flu or for heart attacks, you know, whatever. There's it, just no context. Something. There's yeah. con context, nuance. Those are things that you really need in public health. And we didn't have it. And um, just a whole lot of things um, that the media, I think, really did wrong. Um, and, can, and even with crime and, um, you know, throwing mug shots up all the time of young black men. I mean, those things are insidious and it has an impact. Mm -hmm. You're, and what are you accomplishing with that? What, what story are you telling? What value does this information have to the viewer? And oftentimes it's not much. So um, I you know, really think that TV news um, does a disservice uh, many, many times. But they also uh, are really vital to our democracy. They're vital. We, if the, the, every time you don't have people watching local government, corruption uh, is more likely to happen. And there have sure. been studies showing that when um, you have fewer local reporters, you pay more in tax dollars. Mm. Um, you know, we really, really need a robust media. It's vital to our democracy. Yeah, but it seems like it's gone. It's not Walter Conkrad anymore. Give you know, it's, and I mean, if you ever um, heard about or read the the Wayne County Times? Oh um, gosh, yeah. You know, it's they throw mug shots up mm -hmm. of people who have DWIs and kids have to go to school and say, you know, that's my dad, or whatever. Um, and even for the most minor things. Yes. Yeah. No. It's it's it, um it's I don't like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it, but it is public information. They have the right sure. to do it. Um, they need to ask themselves if if they're really doing a public service, and the people of Wayne County can ask themselves: Is this something that they want to participate in? And if it's not, then don't consume it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, you know, something like is, I can imagine the Democrat Chronicle is almost, you know, is hanging on by a thread now. Um, you know, yeah. is there must be a lot of older people are still getting the newspaper delivered. Oh yeah, on my street, the <laughs> the the guy, the same guy's been delivering it for a while, and oh. you know, it's like two two or three houses on my street. The se seniors, all of them, uh, mm -hmm. do get the paper, and. Um, I don't I don't begrudge them that paper. Yeah. It's something it's something very meaningful to them, um, and it's a tradition. But but uh, it's not. It's a shadow of what it used to be. And Gannett, uh, I just that for profit model now for a company like Gannett that is just shrink, 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 um, and extract every dime they can from the community without providing the service in in return that that it used to provide. I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think that's good, and I don't think they should get bailout dollars reserved for news uh, from the federal government. Mm -hmm. Not for this product. Mm -hmm. So, how do you think we course correct on some of this stuff when it comes to the news or trying to, you know, bridge the divide? I know it's a big question, but you got a big brain, so not nonprofit. Nonprofit news is the future. Um, you've got outlets like the Texas Tribune um, that's doing amazing work. Spotlight PA. You've got you've got some really great nonprofit news outlets that are becoming self sustaining. Oh, City, um, in in New York City, um, City NYC, wonderful website. They do excellent work. That's the future. That's the future. The PBS model. That's the future. Mm -hmm. And it um, really, but it's so high quality, and it's um, I think more sustainable. Mm -hmm. So you're obviously very embedded in the community. Um, you've been a people person your entire life, your entire career here, meeting people through broadcasting, running for office. Do you think you will run for mayor again? Yeah. No, I don't know. I mean, you look, you never say never, but right now I don't have any ambitions. I don't have any plans beyond county legislator. Um, you know, I just won re-election. I don't know what opportunities are going to come up in the future. Um, I would definitely take a hard look at anything. My private life, uh, my day job, um, I'm very satisfied right now with the life that I have. And um, I would have to really make very, very difficult decisions to do anything else. So um, things got more – things – as, as I settled into post-news life, you know, things get more complicated um, to make those kinds of decisions than they were, say, four or five years ago. So, um, 
you know, never say never. I'm really committed to this politics thing and the public service thing. I invested a lot in it. And as long as people will have me, I'll be here. I really fought hard for my seat at the table. And um, I think I'm making a difference. I'm trying really hard. Um but it's hard. I'm part of a women's group uh, on chat. We chat online every day, and and sometimes we meet online too. But uh, you know the Zoom, and and we talk about how hard it is to be uh, women in leadership, and, and um, it's hard. Pol- mm. Politics is just really, really hard. Do you think one of one of the reasons that Trump ended up being so popular uh, is that he had that you know kind of and I'm not comparing you to him, mm. that same kind of outspoken, I'm just, you know, because I don't really People see Trump. People thought they knew him. I don't think Trump is a Republican. Mm. I, I think he I think he, he, he used the Republican Party to, to gain power, but I think, mm. I think Trump is a narcissist yes. who, um, but at the same time, I don't think he, he ever cared about any issues except for power. He's a demagogue. Ex- exactly. Yeah. He's, he's a demagogue. And but what I'm saying is that I see you kind of being very outspoken in a way that he's like, but at the same the pop, time, the pop, you're saying populist populism. Yeah, um, but it's but it's something that I think is that's kind of where we're trending, and you know, I, it's but it's ref, I think it was refreshing to a lot of people, and I think but coming from the left, you're you're you know when you um, didn't when the the. the the primary for for mayor, I was really disappointed, honestly, because I thought you would have made a great mayor. That wasn't one of my <laughs> smartest races to run, but I tried. You know, um, mm-hmm. I'm very flattered that you would say that. I think things worked out the way that they were supposed to work out, and well, we ended up with a terrible mayor. Well, you know what? Um, you know, again, another thing I learned in politics is that corruption. People don't care if it's the, someone that they like being corrupt and if it doesn't affect their lives. And campaign finance corruption is a really difficult thing to explain to people about why that's wrong. I think there was a lot of other types of corruption. Um, a lot of it was legal, even, um, that um, that I really wish our community and everyone you know, would pay more attention to. I mean, Trump broke so many norms when he was in office when as it related to corruption, legal and and maybe illegal. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I think what you're getting at is that Trump was saying things to people that they wanted to hear about um, about their lives and about solving problems. And he spoke to them um, and they felt they knew him, right? Because mm-hmm. he was on TV, they felt they knew him. And I, I would just be, I would warn people that, um, just because you see someone on TV doesn't mean you know them. I mean, sure. when I was a reporter for a long time, I don't know that everyone knew that I was really progressive. Um, mm-hmm. You know, maybe they assumed other things, right? Um, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm really blessed to have had the career that I've had. I, I'm really, really blessed. And it's um, been it's been a hard road sometimes, but that's okay. I brought brought people along with me, and I'm really open about that. And I'm, I'm I feel so fortunate that. Um, feel really fortunate that I can still, t- that I, that I can serve and lead and, and have these conversations, frankly. Yeah. Well, and you never gave up too. That, you have a bulldog in you, right? And so it's something that, and, and that's why you are where you are today because of the fact that you said, I'm going to keep fighting. You're a fighter. Yeah, but it took a toll. I mean, mm-hmm. it took a toll. Not going to lie. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know that, uh, I don't know that I see things quite the same way. I don't know that okay. I'm quite as idealistic. I don't know if I have quite the same fight. Um, I mean, you don't want to be on the opposite side of me in some issues. You definitely, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know that. I don't know that. Um, you know, it's exhausting sometimes. I mean, there's some days. You know, this week. Um, this week, you know, something came up um, internally about redistricting and. You know, definitely made some of my feelings known about how things were going, and I was exhausted just by that because I knew that I was people were not going to be pleased with me as to what I said, and things like that are exhausting because you, sure, you sometimes. Um, but tomorrow night, you know, Democrats are going to gather and and have a nice um, event, uh, mm-hmm. our Hall of Fame. We're going to induct people into our local Hall of Fame, and it'll be a time that we can come together. But there are other times where you have to like say hard things, because um, and and it gets exhausting. <laughs> I don't know what mm-hmm. else to say. Yeah. It. I wish I could. Um, and campaigns are exhausting. Campaigns are exhausting. Um, 
yeah. In in 2019, I knocked on thousands of I mean thousands of doors, mm-hmm. um, and I've uh, I hurt my shoulder from carrying the clipboard so much. I hurt my shoulder. <laughs> I was really, I, mean, I really, uh, I don't ever want to, I, I don't know if I could ever do something like, like that again. Mm-hmm. And this last campaign, by the way, I still walked my whole district. Just might not have walked it three times like I did in 2019. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, hopefully one day you'll be in the Hall of Fame. You're definitely on, yeah, on, the, sure. on the track. You <laughs> we'll know, see. And, uh, we'll see. Yeah. Well, we wish you all the best. Thank and you. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your ideas with us. Um, I'd like to ask our viewers if they think Rachel has broken the stereotype of a politician. <laughs> uh, please drop a comment below and tell us what you think. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel.